Okay, so why do we have a philosopher here in the program? You've heard, <laughs> you've heard so many wonderful uh, theoretical claims, and they're all beautifully supported by empirical evidence. I will not give you any empirical evidence that at least I produced myself uh, today. Instead, I do actually put my philosopher's head on, and I will ask how we make systematic and rational decisions in order to process that evidence in, right, in the right way, or in the best possible way. And in particular, I'm interested in how we process evidence in order to make decisions about which policy to apply in which context or for which purposes. Um, more specifically, I will uh, argue for two um, sub-claims. The first one is that it's worthwhile categorizing behavioral policies into different types or kinds. And that this categorization of kinds then is the basis for making inferences about when or wit, uh, when to apply which uh, uh, policy uh, in which particular context. Yeah? So um, at the same time, I also hope just to get a lively discussion going about the use and the, also the moral acceptability of uh, such behavioral interventions. And of course, I'll, fo I'll be focusing mainly on these two types, boosts and uh, nudges. I'll say a little bit about other types as well. Um, and um, I hope we have enough time at the end to um, discuss any questions you have about this. But let's start with a somewhat dystopic perspective. Huh? Decision making is hard. Maybe it's harder today. Uh, than it used to be. And if you look into the news and uh, manage the day-to-day -day despair uh, that at least overcomes me, you see that people really have a hard time. Huh? So whether this is, it's a hard time, and it's not a hard time because I'm saying that they're doing something wrong, but because they indicate that they themselves are not happy with the choices, with the decisions, or more generally with the kind of behavior that they're exhibiting. So, um, their use of media technology. In Germany, just last week, the uh, uh, Booksellers Association published a new survey. Six and a half million Germans, an additional six and a half millions, have not read a book since 2014. Now, that's about 10% of the population, just dropped out. Haven't touched a book, haven't bought a book in the last four years. Now people go there and ask, what's going on? Why, why are you not reading? And they complain. They say, you know, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Constantly people send me messages, emails, uh, whatever. I need to update my status. I need to sort of, I, I can't, I just don't have the energy to sort of the time uh, to uh, read a book. But they're not happy about that. Huh? They say, I wished I could decelerate my life, but I somehow fail uh, to do that. Which at the same time, you would think, well, Make some choices. Um, try this one, for example. <laughs> huh? So that's uh, that. But it seems difficult. Huh? Similarly, um, financial distress. It's a new study that shows that uh, uh, bankruptcy goes up in the immediate neighborhoods of of neighborhood of those people uh, who win in the lottery. Huh? So you. It's really dangerous to be next to people who win in the lottery because you're likely to actually spend more money on conspicuous consumption and therefore you're more likely to go bust. Now, these people obviously don't want to go bust. They just want to show off that they can keep up with the Joneses and that, is, that has a bad effect. Fake news, well, we have a president who clearly holds the record in uh, having uh, 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 his claims being debunked as either incorre incorrectness or, fa or pure falsities. And yet, if you look at the, um, at, uh, the approval rating, it, that doesn't move at all. So it seems that, in fact, seems to, his supporters seem to think that 
his claims and the, be, him being, uh, I, or his claims being identified as lies, doesn't in some way uh, take away from his credibility or from their approval uh, for uh, him. And so we can go on. We can talk about uh, uh, giving or receiving uh, information from experts and the difficulties with that. We can go into the more regular. Uh, stuff that has been uh, uh, discussed a lot, substance abuse, obesity, failure to eat a healthy diet, and so on. In all these cases, we have people who say, I wish I would do it differently, but somehow I failed to do so, um, and therefore, uh, the government, the policymaker, both the poli government policymaker, but also NGOs or companies are uh, quite interested in somehow helping people along. This is nothing new. The 20th century actually has seen a lot of proposals of this sort. One of the earlier ones, which is actually quite interesting, is uh, this book by uh, Skinner, the psychologist, behaviorist uh, Skinner. This is a novel. Uh, it counts as a utopian novel. Nevertheless, it's a novel about uh, people who go to a commune, and in the commune they're discussing ways how one can influence uh, the, uh, one's environment, one's contexts, in order to modify behavior in such a way as to reach a frictionless community. Huh? How to avoid conflict, how to avoid uh, uh, negative effects for uh, living uh, uh, together. And uh, this was published in uh, 1948, but you see sort of in the 60s and the 70s uh, sort of a, quite a lot of under different titles, whether this is behavioral engineering, behavior modification, behavior management, applied behavior analysis, you see uh, a lot of attempts at sort of trying to figure out how, based on proper scientific evidence, we might be able to adjust people's uh, behavior in uh, beneficial ways. And of course, then uh, the 2008 book by Sunstein and Thaler gave this a whole new uh, wave of um, uh, prominence, and therefore most people today, when they're talking about behavioral policy, they talk about nudges, as if that's the same. Huh? Um, I will come back to that, and I'll argue that that's not the case, but let's take a step back and think about, so what are the assumptions underlying here? all of these attempts of the policymaker going in and helping uh, uh, individuals. In the first place, there's the assumption uh, that the policymaker is benevolent. Uh, so the policymaker has uh, the interest of, has an interest in the welfare, uh, uh, the autonomy, uh, the equality, whatever sort of relevant uh, features of either its citizens or its employees or sort of its stakeholders, whatever this might be. Right? And of course, we can question that, and I think there should be much, should be much more um, uh, sort of uh, 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 public choice um, uh, discussion of uh, these behavioral um, uh, interventions than there currently are. But that's not going to be my focus today. Instead, I want to focus on the second part, which is that these, uh, all of these attempts assume that we can muster evidence, scientific evidence, for uh, this purpose, for behavioral modification, for changing behavior uh, to the better. And then two questions come, out, come up in particular. Uh, so you have either an individual, a specific particular policy, an intervention that someone proposed to you, or you have a whole set of uh, interventions that you might, might be contemplating, and then the question is, well, I want to apply this in this particular environment for this population and for this particular purpose. So which one is the best? Which is the most effective one? What, what gives me what I want to achieve? Uh, what gives it to me in uh, maybe the cheapest way, in the simplest way, maybe in uh, gives the biggest, has the biggest uh, effect size and so on. No, so that's the first question. And the second one is, um, which of these interventions, and again, in this particular environment, for this particular population and so on, is morally permissible? We can expand this and say political permissible, also, of course, questions of legal uh, permissibility, but I think it's, it's enough for our purposes here to ask for uh, moral permissibility. And that leads immediately to an epistemic problem. We're asking for token, for particular 
the evaluation of particular policy interventions. And presumably, in almost all these cases, we haven't, haven't run that policy in that context yet, because that's the point, right? I'm a policymaker. I want to change something. I haven't done so yet. But I need to know, I need to know in advance in order to compare where, how this policy does in this particular context for this, for this uh, uh, population. Yes? Any question regarding number two? Why would the, the answer that number two be only available at exposed? I will, um, well, for beca because I will argue that it will depend on the way how, through which causal pathways uh, the, uh, the policy operates. Yeah? So we need to know properties of, well, we, I think we can answer this even more generally, but that will be my argument. But more generally we might say, well, we need to know a lot about how the policy affects the people in this context, in this population, in order to say whether it's morally permissible or not. And I'll give you examples later on for why this uh, is important. Um, so ex exposed is not an interesting. Answering these questions exposed is not interesting. We need to answer them ex ante. And if we want to answer them ex ante, we need to make uh, inductive inferences. Well, how do we make, how do we do that? Well, like everywhere, we can sort of, we probably will rely on something like a similarity judgment. We'd say, well, here's a policy Y, uh, or here's an intervention Y that has been proved, has been shown to be effective um, um, and permissible, and now we compare our, the policy that we want to uh, apply or in, implement, and we argue that it's similar to the one that has already been uh, properly tested, and therefore uh, we uh, are justified or tend to be justified in concluding that X is uh, uh, effective and permissible as well. The notion of similarity is very similar, or in fact, as uh, Quine has argued, or Quine and other philosophers have argued, it's, very, it's virtually identical to the notion of kind. Yeah? So if we say that we have a number of things that are similar in some way, then we argue that they're that they might, be, might argue that they are of the same kind. And then it is either uh, similarity or sameness of the, same kind, of, the, of the kind that allows us or that justifies our inference. Hence, my interest in categorizing. Huh? So the way how we cut up different policy, how we divide the cake and say this is one kind, that will help us to make inferences about how this type, category, or kind of policy uh, uh, will um, uh, fare in uh, an implementation. Problem with that, of course, is that similarity and kinds can be uh, identified in multiple different ways. Uh, so we need to be quite specific about what we mean by similarity, and we need to be specific what kind of division, how we divide the cake. We can divide the cake in multiple different ways, and uh, that, of course, pushed to the extreme will destroy such an argument, which is actually a very popular exercise amongst philosophers to sort of show how inductive inference goes down the drain, and, or any particular inductive inference goes down the drain if you start multiplying uh, the, way, the different kinds. Yeah, well, <clears throat> equally one can also doubt whether some predicate on which the um, um, kinds are based is projectable, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. In other words, it can be true, it can work now, but it needn't work. Tomorrow. That's right, that's right. So, but I will argue uh, that by choosing the categorization carefully, we can at least be more confident that such stability and robustness will, re will be retained. Even though, of course, I mean, I'm happy to discuss the problem of induction, which after all, in the last 250 years has not been solved. So it's not, we, there, but there are nevertheless different degrees of stability that we are uh, uh, confident, more or less confident in. And that's what we will be relying on. Yes? X and Y can be very dissimilar, but that doesn't mean that X is not better than Y, so more effective and more permissible, right? That's right. So what matters here is that um, 
uh, if we find y to be permissible for a number of reasons, for particular reasons, then the similarity will grant that those reasons, or will give me good reasons to believe that, that, that those reasons or those properties will also be available in X. That's right, but of course, I mean, this, this, arg this argument also works for effectiveness, right? It might be that another policy X, that their policy X is quite dissimilar from Y, which we found to be somewhat effective, and then the dissimilarity actually makes X more effective, yeah? Point totally taken, yeah? So this is obviously very highly simplifying in order to uh, show you or argue for the importance of uh, categorizations. So, our proposal here is to use mechanisms and mechanistic models as the basis for categorizing uh, different uh, kinds. And this is something that, uh, so in the first place, what is a mechanism? Well, a mechanism has been defined as by uh, these people who have been very influential, at least in the philosophy discussion. It's a wonderful paper, so I can recommend it. They, uh, argue that mechanisms are entities and activities uh, that are organized in such a way that uh, they produce um, the uh, a sort of a certain finish, f end result, through a continuous chain of uh, such entities and activities from some starting point. Uh, so this is something that in the first place has, has been uh, used or has been analyzed in uh, biology and uh, neuroscience, but I want to apply this now for uh, uh, cognitive science and apply it on the, um, on the level of mental representations of, uh, of uh, uh, rule, heuristic rules that work with particular mental representations. How does that work? Well, here's a very simple scheme uh, that hopefully will uh, clarify what I mean by a mechanism and why mechanisms are helpful to divide uh, the different kinds of policies in this way. So let's start very simply and say, okay, so minimally for choice, we need a set of alternatives. We uh, need to have some selection rule that picks out from that set of alternatives um, uh, one particular item and that uh, yields um, that yields uh, a choice. But typically, that's far too simple. We want something like a number of properties that are associated with uh, the different alternatives, and then uh, the selection rules might either directly apply uh, to uh, these properties as in, let's say, take the best, or we might have some underlying and separable representation of evaluation, like in a utility function of some sort, and then, of course, that utility function might satisfy standard uh, axioms or not, um, as here. And when we have that, then it also is clear that the decision maker will need some of the information for uh, uh, the available alternatives as well as these properties from somewhere, so there are search rules that help the decision maker to pick out uh, information from the environment. And once we are, have specified the search rules, number of models for um, such search rules that you then feed into such representations, which in turn feed into uh, the choice, then uh, we can also distinguish between those uh, the, that's those cues that are uh, of the environment that are identified by the search rules as being uh, relevant and those that are identified as being not relevant. And one of the innovations of the heuristics and biases tradition has been to be much to insist that those that are not relevant for or that we for the search rules nevertheless play an important role. So there's context in the environment, cues that are not picked up as information by uh, the decision maker, but nevertheless influence the search rules, influence the selection rules and the evaluations. So uh, think of uh, the, uh, for example, setting um, the um, uh, a reference point as a way of, in, or of, of typically implicitly um, a, a reference point that influences an evaluation. Think of anchoring as a way that influences search rules. And uh, think of 
um, whatever was the example I had for, well, and there are also context, contextual cues that influence uh, the selection rules directly. So if we have this, by now you see that I'm not talking about any particular mechanism. I'm talking about sort of a, a meta model of mechanism in which you, from which we could now build individual mechanisms, uh, uh, how uh, a individual decision makers arrive at uh, a choice from uh, picking out different information and being influenced by different cues uh, uh, in, uh, from the environment. Based on this, we can now distinguish at least four uh, kinds of uh, intervention possibilities, uh, namely where they influence and what kind of uh, influence they will have on decision making. When we coerce an individual, then we either take away directly uh, an alternative, yeah? so if there is no cocaine, then you can't choose it, or uh, if we, uh, we just change some of the properties, as when we uh, make uh, gambling illegal, then uh, if you choose to gamble, one of the options might involve, or some of the options might involve, uh, going to prison um, or paying a fine. When we incentivize, we're also changing uh, the, uh, the, some of the properties, as when there is a subsidy for um, music lessons, uh, that changes uh, the, uh, out the, the way how uh, people will see uh, such a choice for themselves or their children, um, because it's now less costly and maybe therefore more attractive. That's pretty standard stuff and maybe not that interesting. It's just important to see that they're different from new nudges and boosts that I now want to discuss. In, by, when we inform an individual, then we provide either information that has not been available uh, in the environment uh, before, uh, but that are uh, of the format uh, that the agent might look for through her, her search. Or uh, we uh, might change available information in its format in such a way uh, that it actually fits uh, the search uh, activity of uh, the individual. In contrast, when we nudge, then we're, we're changing the non-information, the seemingly non-relevant context. And we do so in order to harness the influence that this context has on search rules, on selection rules, and on evaluation. This, of course, requires that we, if we want to have a predictable change in behavior, that uh, we uh, keep, that we assume that these uh, selection, these different influences on these different rules remain stable, even though we're now changing the context. I'll come back to that um, in a moment. Now contrast that with boosts. Boosts don't intervene in uh, that non-information relevant context, but rather they intervene in the rules themselves. They try to train people in uh, heuristics, in rules, either for search or for evaluation or for, uh, selection, for, for making decisions um, that either they didn't have, that these people didn't have access to, or that they had access to but didn't, weren't applying in this particular context uh, that the policymaker suggests is of relevance for them. So this now dovetails with our uh, dis with uh, our distinction in the various papers, where we say the nudges strategically harness bounded rationality. They make use of the knowledge that the various contextual cues influence how uh, the heuristics operate in, as part of the decision-making uh, mechanism. Yeah? And uh, by influencing uh, this context, uh, they then influence how information is searched and what alternative is selected. In contrast, a boost aims to directly change some of the applied heuristics. I, I mean, some, sometimes, sometimes people object because it fosters competences. I should maybe try to find something else because it is maybe not neutral enough. I don't, this can, of course, go wrong, right? You're replacing 
someone's using a particular search rule for a particular problem, and you're suggesting that, you, that she use a different search rule instead. That might actually make things worse if you're not careful, right, for reasons that might even be unforeseen. Huh? Um, but it aims to, uh, it, it, it obviously aims to improve uh, competences even if uh, that might occasionally fail by intervening on these rules and uh, therefore trains the decision maker uh, to employ a different heuristic that hopefully is more adaptive uh, than the previous one. Okay, so talk for half an hour, that's enough for the moment. Let's uh, do a little exercise. I've prepared a number of cases some of them I just plucked from the news. Others um, I either invented myself or uh, uh, from, and, uh, from the literature. If you could sort of do, divide, so just take one of these leaflets in such a way that you're always in groups of three or four. And then uh, in those groups discuss uh, in these, these three questions. Okay, are we, um, is everybody happy to continue? Are we sort of, are we there because, <laughs> are you? Good, okay, then let's, uh, I will now, let's go through the individual cases uh, and I would ask the, I would ask the respective groups who have discussed that case to uh, describe briefly what's going on and why they, or what they think is going on and sometimes, at least, we have multiple groups. I think there was a bit of a mess up with, uh, with uh, some of the distribution, but that should be okay. Huh? So we'll go through all the cases, and then everybody can actually listen a little bit about what else was in the discussion. Okay, so the first one uh, was speeding. Who had speeding? Uh, only one, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, if you wanna, what, would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about what was going on here? What do you think? What 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 is the uh, where does the where does the policy intervene and what how what kind of me mechanistic uh, process is involved? Right. So we think this is pretty much a nudge, and um, it it intervenes at the context. So mm -hmm. and the causal pathway would be basically. So we're kind of confused with the causal pathway. But we are inclined towards like it affecting the selection rule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, because like um, it's not, it's, it's definitely not a coercion because like it's, it's, it's a nudge because you're making something more obvious or you're kind of creating this illusion that you would crash if you do not stop and uh -huh. so yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I think I, I, I agree. now we don't have another group to disagree, unfortunately, right. in your case. <laughs> but let me tell you what I thought how this might work. And this might also help you to understand what, why the somewhat complicated scheme here, how this might work, right? So in, in this case, I think we're talking about a very simple, intuitive, emotion-driven decision, right? So there's probably not even thinking about properties. It's just like the alternatives are foot on the brake or not. And the only thing that you see is obstacle. Huh? There's, there's something on the road, and it looks massive. So then the reaction here, this, the, the, selection, the, the selection rule here tells you, stop. Right. Right? And this, which in this case actually looks, it looks pretty real, even though it yeah, is a it, graffiti, it graffiti artist who painted this. Uh, generates this without actually producing the potential hazard. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I agree, I think this is a classic example of a nudge where you change the environment, you're triggering a, a, a very, very autom almost automatic response uh, and that, that creates a change but in you behavior. Can't create a hazard because if you have a car behind you and you suddenly break when you see this. And right. Yeah. That's right, totally. But I mean, it's less of a. I actually, I, when I when I picked this photograph out, someone said, "Luckily, they didn't actually put." I mean, so I would. It wouldn't have been beyond them to put real concrete slabs up there. So this is sort of expresses how what people think about communal uh, services in yeah. uh, provincial Germany. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, so my initial inclination was to agree fully that it's a nudge, but that makes me. I uh, want to ask you a question about information because <clears throat> as I was considering your schematic on the previous slide, 
and thinking about the information search process while one's driving down the road, it's basically continuously scanning the environment mm -hmm. for any environmental cues that might uh, alter your current strategy of driving. Right. And so in that case, seeing an obstacle on the road is, is clearly informative. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And in this case, it's a false illusion, so it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's still somehow information as far as your, your, your decision-making system is concerned. So uh, yeah? it, it somehow blurs the line between uh, context Good. and information. Yeah. So what yeah. do you have to say about that? Yeah. Okay, interesting, uh, because what you're then saying is that this could be a, it's not in the, if we inc incorporate in information policies, also disinformation policies, then this would, could be counted as something like uh, telling people in the newspaper that something terrible is going to befall them if they drive through that road faster than 30 kilometers an hour or something, right? So we're, we're working on maybe on with some superstition or I mean, this could be it. We could, we could spin, and spin that story further. I don't actually, I mean, this, I'm not saying it's either one, right? I'm, what I'm offering here is more like an analytic framework that allows us to further investigate what is going on. So in many of these cases, I think, that I've given you, there is some ambiguity here that ultimately requires uh, further empirical uh, investigation. And I think that's, this might be relevant because whether we consider this a, a sort of a misinformation campaign or a nudge campaign might have, uh, for example, effects on how we morally assess this. No? So the point here is not to now say once and for all, this is this particular policy. And one of the issues is that currently we're not looking a whole lot into the mechanisms of different, uh, of different behavioral uh, results with typically when we, I mean, behavioral economics is largely based on, labor on laboratory findings and all they record are effect sizes, right? So intervention, behavior changes to this degree. And how this happens is often entirely ambiguous. No? Okay, let's move on. Choosing treatments. No? So here, uh, who had that? There was one over here, yes. Yeah. And it, but there's another, you're a separate group, or did you all work together? Okay, great. Okay, so one mic for these mm -hmm. You can start. All right. Uh, so this involved a program that trains people to translate relative risk into natural formats and vice versa. Uh, we thought the policy intervened on the selection uh, evaluation aspect or rule. Uh, and... So yeah, it was, we thought it was a boost. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we agree. Um, maybe it's an extension because we're both neuroscientists. So we wondered if there are some feedback loops in the model. Mm -hmm. So based on this, so, so what is downstream affected is only the link between the evaluation and the actual choice in the end, we thought. But maybe also people get more interested in what kind of information is more about it. Like if they become, for example, more skeptical, mm -hmm. that might also have a feedback loop on the search rule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that they're not so easily accepting information, but they become more critical, and then yeah. they go back in the model, actually. And there is, of course, uh, it's, not a, it's not a pure translation. Right? I mark this somewhere uh, that they, so they need to also, when they translate into natural frequency formats, they need to ask for base rate information. The information isn't immediately available, so you can't just translate. You have to say, wait a moment. Okay, so who taught me about this? Relative risk. Now tell me what is the base rate. Only then can I formulate uh, the natural frequency, right? So that's a, in this way, that already is, I, I talk, but I entirely agree. This has, but I would also say that uh, we are here uh, intervening on either only uh, the selection or, uh, also, or both the selection and the search rule. Um, and in fact, Ralph and I have used this as an example of, or one of the examples of a boost. In contrast to, for example, simply uh, changing the format, simply saying, okay, everything that is in relative risk is now going to be translated into frequency. That would be a change in uh, the context. Huh? So, and that would be, I mean, arguably, that would be a notch instead. Okay. Energy provider choice. Who had that? 
You too? Yeah? And yes? Good. You want to start? Um, yeah. Um, there was um, a company, I think it was in Zürich, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And um, I think first, um, not many households were um, getting their energy from, I think, a more sustainable source. And then um, the city of Zürich wrote um, a letter that um, from the 1st October on, the default option would be um, to use ecological, more mm -hmm. sustainable energy, and that resulted in in yeah, way more um, people um, choosing the ecological. Uh, they could they could of course uh, say that they didn't want that, but they had to do something mm -hmm. to prevent getting a sustainable power. So and then um, it ended up many more people um, having sustainable um, energy, and. Um, we actually, we had like an argument of what, what it excellent, would be. Excellent. <laughs> um, um, yeah, Kim was more saying that this was coercive, arguing that it changed actually properties um, of the option to take um, the less sustainable uh -huh. power uh -huh. okay. in, in ways of having um, to put in time and that could mm -hmm. be counted as a mm -hmm. property. Maybe also been incentive for the more sustainable um, option because yeah, then yeah. it's less time and consuming. I was more on the nudging part because actually the default option shouldn't change mm -hmm. what you want. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, maybe it's interesting what the other Excellent. group has to say. Thank you. What did you think? Okay, so um, we decided to label this a nudge mm -hmm. um, because normally, as I understand it, defaults are considered nudges, and the whole um, debate about no, uh, defaults then being coercive is a whole other story, because if you look at empirical data, it often is coercive, because a lot of people don't opt out, mm -hmm. but from a more logical perspective or philosophical perspective, I'd say it's not coercive, because you still have um, the, the opportunity to opt out, and also the, the costs are negligible mm -hmm. uh, in comparison to the weight of the decision. Lovely, thank you very much. I think this is a, at the face of it, I think it's a, it's a very simple uh, case because this is typically one of the prime examples, I mean, default setting is one of the prime examples of uh, the Nudge approach. You find this all the time associated uh, with the Nudge approach in the literature. But in fact, I also believe that this is not as clear cut um, as, uh, as it is often presented. Uh, so we, in fact, know very little about what the actual mechanisms are through which defaults affect people. Do, defaults do affect people. With that we know, we know their effect size, but we have some evidence that this happens through multiple, but potentially at least through multiple different ways. Uh, so one way would simply be uh, that um, it, for example, changes the reference point. And if we have loss aversion, then people might be uh, willing to stick with the, what they already have. Huh? This is the default. In this case, I think it's plausible to call this a nudge. Huh? We're basically using this kind of framing and people don't get away, from, don't want actually to evaluate it, but due to their particular kind of evaluation that we are exploiting, they're not getting away from it. They're sticking with it. However, there are other cases where maybe uh, lack of resources and time and effort and uh, in concentration and sort of focus, uh, we might exploit that. We might be able to say, well, someone, is, they, they're so busy, they can't answer all the mail from uh, the public service uh, sector, so we just send them a lot of things that say, hey, we're gonna change this, now default is this, and let's see how many times they actually come back to us. In that case, I think we're getting closer to a, to a kind of really changing the game in a way that you have an alternative cut off. Uh, and then, we're, then the, the criticism of uh, a, a sort of a court, some, something coercive uh, might stick. Yeah. And, um, but I'm not saying that, the, that all defaults are coercive. I'm just saying that, well, depending with the, the kind of mechanism, we might actually uh, get different results. You disagree with that? 
So uh, I think earlier you said that coercion was restricting the choice set. Right. That's one. But remember that coercion has, I have included, because in the most extreme sense, we are actually taking away an option. But typically, when I, for example, when, we, when Parliament passes a law that says we're going to now make this an offense or a crime, then they're not really taking the option away. They're just changing the property of, if you do it, you can do it, but you, that, it comes with a cost. So it's incentivizing. It's a, it, it, exactly. So there's a, there's a sliding towards incentivizing. Um, if we want to, I think otherwise we, don't, we almost have no coercive policies if we, uh, I think if we don't include that. A default with an opt-out, by definition, cannot be coercive because uh -huh. there's always the opportunity to opt-out. That's right. Perform, but it might be performa. Right? So I might make it so difficult for you that you actually, that for, I might say, Here, this, here's the option, but you actually have to jump five meters high from standing in order to do it. For pro forma, the option is, the, is the, to opt out is still there, right? So and this is, the question is whether we can, through, we is, create situations where people actually are almost, where it's very hard for them to opt. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not invested in this. The important thing here is to see that with a clarification of through the mechanism, we actually get a clear view of what, uh, in which category uh, a particular default belongs. And that's important to me, not to declare this again, this one is, in fact, uh, only to be understood as this mechanism. OK. Avoiding teenage pregnancy. Who had that? OK, here we have a. Yeah, we have three groups. Let's see. Who wants to start? Yeah, do you want to start? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. So um, the idea is that there is an um, incentive system for keeping uh, girls in school and without babies, or baby-free, as the ad says. So um, they get, they go into a program, they do some, they do weekly meetings, and they receive uh, a, a dollar amount every week, they do not get pregnant. So the, the meetings are about uh, abstinence and use of contraceptives. Uh, I didn't make this one up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. And so um, they will only get the amount once they enroll in college and there are some screening criteria. So girls must, never, must have never been pregnant, be enrolled in school. Uh, have a desire to attend college and uh, have a sister who gave birth before 18. Right, so they're in a high-risk group, right? Uh, so uh, we thought that this was, well, we had some discussion, but we thought this was both informing, informing about the uh, abstinence and the use of con contraceptives, uh -huh. and an in uh, and a in incentivization mm -hmm. by changing the properties of the choice set of these girls, right. making... Uh, the option of not getting pregnant more attractive. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So that would be our answer. And and, um, and yeah. Good. Yes. Hi. Uh, so we were had the similar discussion where we understood as well that there was a lot of incentivizing and informing involved, but we actually ended up thinking that this could qualify as a hybrid with its highest probabilities nudging more than anything else. Um, we thought that basically because they are not only trying to inform these people and these girls and incentivize them, uh, since we're talking about 90 um, minutes meetings every week, and that involves girls that could be as young as 12 years old, so we're taking, talking about 52 weeks for six years. I think the, the content of the information would have elapsed long ago for them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more about building a culture that would help them stick with that information and would incentivize them to, to, to basically go through it up until they arrive to age 18. So I would consider it as a very, very hard form of nudging. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And there was a third group. Yes. I think we had a similar uh, discussion about uh, 
the limits between uh, incentivizing and nudging. There was one thing that wasn't really clear to me. It's what's the difference between changing the context and changing the properties of the options? So in uh, the in changing the context, for example, it's sort of the way typically a default set a default setting is described, you would say there is no relevant property that is changed if we just set one as uh, the the default. Huh? The, op the, the, the alternatives remain the same. They retain all the different, alter the different properties, but we're setting something that seems to be ancillary on top. It should be a rational decision maker should not care about whether this is the default as you can freely deviate from the default. And yet, we find that people, that has a strong influence. Yeah, so that would be a difference between, it was something that people wouldn't search out. They wouldn't say, oh, in order to make a choice, I will have to know whether this is the default or not. Yeah, but in the end, the, nevertheless, the default is something that is, uh, is relevant for their. So ch measure. changing the default would mean changing the context? Yeah. Or, okay. Okay, yeah, I, I very much agree with that. It is, I believe that we often find policies that are hybrids, uh, that are compounds, that consist of different parts. Uh, in this case, I, would, I, I, I very much like the, uh, the culture building as, a, as, a, as, the, as part of the analysis. I would also stress that it would perfect, if it was only incentivizing, it shouldn't matter whether they get a dollar a day or whether they get uh, the, let's say, $365 at the end of each year, or even get the whole lump sum at the end when they enter college. As a, in, I mean, instead, these, this program goes, into, goes quite, quite a long way into the effort of saying, no, no, you're accumulating every day, you're getting some extra increment. And that seems to go against a purely incentivizing strategy or purely incentivizing interpretation. Uh, in addition to, uh, anyway, they, they have, they, they do inform, they might also actually, and, and they do uh, generate um, some culture of, uh, that might consist of social pre peer pressures of some sort. Yes? But that would go beyond the initial definition of nudging. I think uh, they're fair, uh, the authors are fairly explicit about that an incentive that, that uh, changing prices or paying people no. money is not nudging. That's right. So it would be, in this case, you would have to sort of see that there is, that the way how, there is incentivization happening, but the way how the incentivization is provided clearly takes into account that there are ways how we can incentivize more or less, and that seems to go beyond the mere monetary value of what you're offering. So it matters, context matters here a lot. Right. Yeah, so that, and that's where the nudge comes in, or that's, I would argue. I have no, I, you might, yeah, I think I saw you from, there were, oh, it doesn't matter, okay, we'll have time. Uh, hi, I just want to agree with uh, Stefan. I, I don't think any choice architecture is happening here. Um, and, uh, which would qualify it as nudging. So all we're doing is incentivizing a certain type of behavior, which we think is... What, are you saying it would make no difference that we actually sort of multiply... I mean, we'd give them the lump sum at the end. We just say, so at the end, you'll get something like uh, $2,000 or $3,000 in no, college. No, uh, I'm not saying that doesn't oh. matter. All I'm saying is that... I don't think there is uh, a rearrangement or uh, architecture of options happening in order to qualify this as a nudge. Um, going back to your own framework, I, uh, I think it's a clear example of incentivization, uh, but of course there are different ways of incentivizing. Some of them are more effective than others. So this is a gradual Yeah, but, the, but the, yeah. the incent, I mean, if we're looking at the monetary value, there's no difference whether you accumulate it day after day or whether you get it a lump sum at the end, right? So, no program, sorry? Very program to no program, and not incentivation chapter one to incentivation chapter two. So I get what you're saying. 
I'm not. Because I could, I could but what these people could say, if you're, not, if you're not pregnant by the time you're entering college, we give you $3,000, right? That would be the same, or, and you can, you, I guess, I guess my point is, uh, if you argue this is a nudge, can you show us where is the choice architecture? So what, how is, where is the arrangement of choices? So the, the arrangement now is that there's a, there's a, con there's a, there's a di this is now conceptualized as a day-to-day -day decision with an immediate feedback of here you get your incentive of $1 every day instead of making it a choice that is, ba that is basically conceived as mm -hmm. a five years of uh, remaining uh, not, or not, being, not becoming pregnant. But by that logic, any incentive is a nudge because you have to pay out in some way. Um, excuse me, I have a very concrete example in my head which made me say that this is nudging. If it was only about them not getting pregnant, they could have easily said, whoever wants to sign up for having uh, free patches, contraceptives, it would even be cheaper for them to implement a policy where whatever girl thought that it's good for them to have an implant that would make them avoid pregnancy, and in terms of money, it would be much cheaper for the program. Here, they're making it conditional for them entering college. And I'm pretty much guessing if you started at 12 and at 17 or 18, some days before you finished high school and you're en about to enter college, you got pregnant, what happens to your fund? You're not accessing it. More than that, you're going to be, again, I repeat, 52 weeks per year, one hour and a half, sitting in a group where there is a community building with a culture of let's stick it together, let's not get pregnant, let's enter college. That's I, not simple incentivization. I, I very much enjoy this. We still have two cases to go, and I still have my, the second part of my talk to give. So can we continue this at the barbecue, for those who are interested, with respect to this particular reaction? Because I think it's very interesting. I do not, I'm, maybe you can convince me otherwise, but I don't think that my argument depends on whether we decide whether this is a hybrid or whether this is a sort of, whether there's a nudge component to it or not, okay? Can we put it this way? Let's go on to the HIV prevention. Who had that? Uh-huh, and you too, yeah. You wanna start? Hmm? Sure, so this is a similar program in, except that they're trying to reduce HIV rates. Um, and that they are, it's essentially an abstinence only program. So they're encouraging through education that people only abstain from having sex or if they have sex that they go back to abstaining from having mm -hmm. sex. Um, <laughs> we're, I'm, I'm actively not commenting on that. Um, <laughs> so um, it also and teaches people how to avoid social peer pressure and um, sexual advances. So we had a lot of debate that was, I think, a little bit similar to the debate we just had in here. Um, we think that this policy intervention operates through multiple um, areas, including the environment. Um, it's coercive in that it's limiting the number of options that people have. It's um, changing the amount of information that they have. Um, and it could be even considered a boost if you take into the the account the part where they rehearse, rehearse how they'll respond in certain situations. Uh-huh, thank you. There's a group up here and also, okay. yeah. Um, we also had a mix of stuff there, but we didn't really put course, coercion in there, because the options are still all there. Um, I mean, they can still decide to have sex or not. Uh, they're just sort of encouraged. Um, so we had information in there. Um, and we had boost in there. Did we? Yeah, we did. Because they, they, um, there's a sentence where they explicitly say, so encourages both primary abstinence and secondary abstinence. So when the options are there and you have all the information, um, they try to sort of push a decisions towards the, well, one direction. Um, so there's a boost in the selection, action selection or um, part okay. of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So um, I think that the, uh, I agree that 
there's a, it's, I find it in, an interesting and complex case because for one thing, uh, this is about education of children and uh, it seems the info, if we can talk about information campaign, then it's about withholding information. Huh? So it's, sort of, it's basically t saying, we're not telling you about safe sex methods and we're not teaching you in those and um, instead we're therefore making maybe having sex look a lot worse than otherwise it might look. Huh? Um, however, I, I do agree with the group in the back that this part here seems to be uh, a boost. Huh? So learning how to deal with peer pressure for even in this context would be, uh, would be a way how to acquire a new heuristic. I'm not convinced that, um, ab that abstaining from sexual activity can be seen itself as a description of a heuristic. It seems to me more like a value, like sort of don't do it. But it's not a, it doesn't, they don't, so far, nobody seems to have, I mean, this seems to be a way how maybe you could say, well, if I actually have the value, then as here's a way how I can cope with anybody uh, suggesting sex, and I'm not, I, I want to say no. But the abstainment itself is not, is hard to describe as a, for me at least, as a skill. And therefore, I have a difficulty describing what you described here, up here, as itself, as a boost. Well, let's not do it is sort of the simplest heuristic possible, right? Just, just don't do it. Isn't it? There's sort of it's like that's eating grandma. Like grandma tells you, don't don't eat food. Yeah, exactly. Don't touch the hot oven. Don't do it. Okay, good. So complicated case, but I, 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 I interesting to what extent. I, I would insist that by boosting, we mean that we actually give people some competence. How? to uh, uh, progress on such a decision. And this seems to be largely just, to, as you say, don't do it. Okay, last one. Helping harassment victim, victims. Who had that group up here? Uh, only one or? Okay, yeah, okay. So tell us. No, you go, you go right ahead. <laughs> okay. um, after some discussion, we came up with, uh, we, we decided that overall this is a boost and it's at the selection prop, selection mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, but after sitting here and some thought, I was also thinking uh, that the first, the first picture is actually somewhat coercive in the phrase, and this is my belief, uh, <laughs> that the what to do, that you have an, just saying that, that you have an obligation to do this uh, it, I, I feel that that is somewhat co coercive in just in the verbiage. So you uh, mean uh, maybe not coercive? It doesn't prevent you from doing other things, but maybe it sort of suggests quite strongly that this is the way that, to go, and it sort of it, that it's wrong. it stacks the cards in a certain way. It's that it's somewhat wrong if you don't uh -huh. go, mm -hmm. go down this yeah, path. Yeah. Um, okay. But but the but the secondary part, I certain like. I think we all agree that yeah. that is a, a boost. So for those who didn't see this, this is something that was put up uh, in Boston and public transport, uh, uh, in public transport and also public transport stops. And it suggests yeah, a way exactly. how one can, uh, how one can mitigate, how, how one can mediate or sort of help in situations of very high aggression uh, harassment. Uh, where lots of people maybe also legitimately say, I don't want to get involved because I might well become the target myself, so I'd rather stay out. And here is a, here is a way how to basically ignore the aggressor, only focus on the victim, uh, and therefore create some kind of safe space for the victim at that moment. So it is, a, and I thought this was clearly a, a comp, it was a, something that, at least for me, was new. It seemed quite constructive as a way of, I, if I wanted to actually get involved, this was something I have now learned by that this might, this, this might work. It's worthwhile trying it out. Uh, and therefore, I thought it was clearly a case of a boost. Uh, I want also yes. to add that we were also discussing as a second possibility, in addition to the boost, that since this is uh, posted publicly on buses, it changes also a little bit the environment on uh -huh. the bus. Uh -huh. Because people, as, long, as soon as they get on the bus, they will see this. Islamophobic harassment. That's, you know. that's right. And so, in, in some capacity, it could be also part of a, of, a, of a nudge in that kind of sense. It does affect the context, perhaps, but I wonder whether it's more. It's. I would think in this case, 
it, it changes the environment. And the question is, is it context that is non-informative, but sort of might influence heuristics, or is it actually information? Because now, it, it, to me, it is more informing that the city cares, at least a little bit, put up 50 posters in the, <laughs> what is it, 5 million city people. So it's not exactly huge, right? But there's some effort. Some people care. So, uh, but I, I'm not sure that it's a nudge because it's not clear how we would influence any particular heuristic in a decision process uh, by changing the environment in this way. Yeah, I just want to add that I think it changes the environment perhaps almost through information. Like perhaps if you weren't aware that Islamophobic, uh, Islamophobic harassment was occurring, seeing this poster changes the environment in that uh -huh. now you are aware that it is something that happens. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I hope we can discuss a little more um, um, at, the, uh, at the barbecue about these cases. I'm happy to do that. Let me now, so here, this is what I thought the results were, and we've discussed them, and I think there's been a large agreement. We uh, look that up later. Let me now go back and say, okay, so I've offered you this, this general scheme, and we've now exercised, tried to make use of that in some ways. But why? Why would we even use such a categorization by mechanism. It's not necessary. It's actually not something that's currently done. So we're really proposing a change. Um, as I said, there is very little evidence at this point produced for uh, the different mechanisms. And, for, and in order to answer that, let's go back to uh, the earlier slide where I said, the goal, what are the goals of inference? What, are, what were the questions that we are asking? Huh? And the questions were, what is more effective? Which policy is more effective for a particular instance, and which one is more morally uh, permissible? Let's focus first on the effectiveness question. So here we have a substantial problem. Evidence that we currently have for, for such policy intervention typically shows that an intervention is efficacious. This is perhaps so a bit of a mouthful, but it's very helpful to distinguish between effectiveness and efficaciousness. This goes back to uh, the philosopher Nancy Cartwright, wrote a wonderful book, by the way, very worthwhile reading, very easy reading to evidence-based policy, um, where she says, we know that a certain proposed policy has been shown to be, to have an effect, of a substantial effect size in some environment, typically a laboratory environment, maybe sometimes a field Environment. in some cases, field experiments too. But typically, this will vary, be quite different from the, from the environment and the population where we want to implement this policy now. So therefore, even though we might uh, have uh, the efficaciousness, it is not obvious that we can infer from the identity of the in just the intervention that therefore it will have the same, show the same effect in the uh, target environment and target population. Huh? We can't, and this will be an alternative way of thinking about similarity. Simply, and I think people implicitly do that, they say, oh, default setting has, is effective. We, we see all these experiments where in the lab people actually change their, uh, their choices once the defaults are changed. Well then what all we do is we compare policy, the policy intervention by the similarity of the interventions. We're not looking at how this interacts with uh, the uh, environment and with uh, the population. And their differences between environment and population might make, uh, have important consequences for how effective the policy is when implemented in such a different um, uh, environment. Huh? So, that's, the, uh, uh, that's what I'm saying here. So what we need, or what helps, I'm not saying what we, that we need it. I'm saying what, one way how this helps us is that we, get, we actually acquire mechanistic information huh? to determine whether those differences in the population and in the environment actually will have an effect on uh, how uh, much uh, the intervention will change or will not change uh, behavior. So think about, just to go back now to some examples um, to make this clear. Think about the scheme as I gave it to you before. A nudge affects the context and because the context influences 
uh, either search or selection rules, the influencing of the contacts affects uh, the, uh, the choice. That requires, however, it assumes that uh, the rule, the search and selection rules don't change when I change the context. Yeah? So we need a de the default, sort of, let's say, let's put it very simply, let's say the, the simplest heuristic would be always go with the default, choose the default. Yeah? If that were the heuristic, then I could change whatever option is the default, and I would actually create, would therefore affect uh, a change in choice. However, if this might only work for certain default, for certain options, let's say for those options that I set as default that are novel, uh, that really stick out, but not for those options that are sort of more, the more common ones that people were used to before, then a change in the context might not lead to a change in the behavior. So what we need is the stability of heuristics in order to effectively change people through nudges. While for boosts, we don't need the stability. In fact, we need something quite the opposite. We need to be able to teach people different heuristics, and there must be, in the moment, the heat of the moment of making the decision, actually be able to then use that alternative heuristic. If this was hardwired, it wouldn't work. So this, in fact, is, I think, one of the fundamental distinctions between uh, the research program of the simple heuristic research program and the biases and heuristics program. And it's often we get hung up on whether, whether people are, in fact, irrational or irrational. And I think that's a very, that's a bit of a red herring. What, this is, what really is often at stake is whether people are capable of changing the heuristics they're using for some decisions in particular context or for particular purposes. And uh, the heuristics and bias, uh, sorry, the, the simple heuristics um, program has provided some evidence that at least in some cases, people are able to change their heuristics. So when it comes to the, some of you might know about the recognition heuristic, they show that, well, in those moments where the recognition heuristic is not adaptive, we have evidence that people then are not using it. So they're not, mis they're not actually then misled. They're using the heuristic, but they're dropping it when they see, oh, this, is, this, can't, this can't work. No? While on the other hand, uh, the heuristics and biases tradition argues that heuristics largely are not changeable. They are very stable. Unless you think that um, I have a lot of text on the left and very little on the right, here's an old chestnut uh, to show that. Which of the lines is longer? Hmm? Same? How, how many of you think it's the same? Tch, got you. <laughs> right? Well, you can't see this, actually. You know about it, but you can't see it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't change it. It's the, look, it's, no, no, no. So the picture is exactly the same. So you can't see it, actually. They, oh, oh, it's very right. <laughs> but I think this is a good example. And it is not surprising that Kahneman Tversky early on talked about cognitive illusions, because the analogy to visual illusions, I think, is, is, is very convincing. Uh, if, you, if we're talking about the use of heuristics that are similar to, to visual illusions, boosts have stand no chance. Uh, you can't boost this, as I just showed you. Uh, you all know about it, and you still don't see it. So, therefore, we don't boost airplane pilots when they're subject to these kinds of visual illusions when approaching a runway. We just change the cockpit in such a way that these visual illusions don't, uh, don't occur, because it's so damn hard to actually uh, avoid them. So here, there's, there's a lot of good reasons why sometimes we want to nudge. The point here is, that neither of these programs is correct in saying that it's universal. Huh? It's, in some cases, it's malleable. In other cases, it's not. And we have to find out. And depending on, where, on which one it is, that's the kind of policy we should apply. And this is where the categorization uh, is very helpful. Huh? If we're able to say, here, we have a, this is a boost. It, it requires 
the teachability of a heuristic. And you can show me that in the environment in which you want to implement your policy, something like this is happening. That's it. We shouldn't even go any further. That's the end of the story. Go to another, try another policy. If, however, there is uh, malleability, then uh, there, or even worse, or even worse for the nudge, uh, if, the, if the heuristic actually changes with the interventions in the context, then that's a problem for the nudge. Then we shouldn't maybe think of uh, trying a nudge. Yes? But a nudge is always in a certain context, right? So, uh, so if a nudge works in a the context, then the... Uh... So a nudge is changing the context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so here the, the point would be to say, well, look, if you're, you're proposing to nudge in a particular way, and I'm asking, what kind of heuristic are you targeting through this contextual change? Is there any evidence that, the, that this relationship between con contextual cue and uh, heuristic is stable? Or might it be that, in fact, when I, shift the, when I change the context, that then the decision makers actually use a different heuristic? In that case, you should not use a nudge. Because then you're, I mean, you don't know which way uh, the uh, contextual effect goes. Right? So that's the, that's, the, that's the point that the categorization can help you with. There are other features. And, oh yeah. I, I often think um, this distinction you made on the previous slide is something I often think about in, the, in terms of. Um, conscious heuristics versus unconscious heuristics. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me quite clear distinction that those heuristics that we either are consciously aware of or can be made consciously aware of are ones that can be helped by boosts and the others are not. And, and, like, and likewise, those that are just simply unconscious and will never be able, at least in the near future, uh, to be made conscious. Uh, are the ones that are permanently affected by biases, and, and so I agree with both schools yeah. of thoughts, and I, I think... So I'm not sure con con awareness is the important thing, but I think what is important ultimately is sort of them, some uh, sort of degree of, 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 how, of automaticity. Uh, sort of the, so it is malleability. I think there's a correlation. We might be, it's more typical that we're mal that, the, uh, that, that those heuristics that we, that we actually, that are malleable are, we are also aware of. But I, for example, was not aware of uh, the heuristic I'm using when uh, why I might be staying out of uh, helping people who are harassed. I'm just simply go like, I don't want to be part of that. And then the, the poster I like because it tells me, hey, actually, you could try a different approach here. But that, that, it's only at that moment that I become aware. And as, as you said, it's not, I might not have been aware before. So by teaching you some alternative, you become aware that in fact this is just one way how you could behave. There are different ways. Yeah? So that's the, but yes. Okay, um, other, fe other features, oh, we're almost done, um, if, that are also of interest are questions of, for example, homogeneity. Uh, we're, in, we're intervening not on individuals, but we're intervening on the context. So now we're typically thinking of a population situation. So a lot of people, and they're all affected by the same contextual features that I'm changing. I'm changing the default for everybody. Well, if everybody follows the same heuristic, or at least a large part follows the same heuristic, then that's good for the nudge, right? Then we have a good idea of which direction the population choice will take. However, it might be in some cases that people use very different heuristics, therefore react differently, in which case it's gonna be a mess. So nudges require a certain homogeneity of the, influence, the influences that the contextual cues have. Uh, boosts don't require to the same extent because uh, we uh, don't affect everybody by training them with certain heuristics. Boosts, however, require that people are motivated. It's very hard to even train someone in a heuristic if they have no interest. I, I won't even be able to teach you something if you say, but I don't care about helping people who are harassed. Huh? That's, that's not going to work, and you will not apply it anyway. So motivation is something that is a criterion that is of, is of necessity here. Huh? This list goes on. 
Yeah? So there's a long list of different features that are, that are required for these different mechan mechanisms through which the intervention, the respective intervention types work. So what you can see is the program is we specify the, the different categories and then we're able to enlist what the necessary conditions are that must be in place for such, a, such an intervention to be successful or not. It's then a second step to say, okay, so here's the token policy that I want to evaluate and see which, in which, into which category does it fall. And as we saw before, that's not always trivial. So in some cases, uh, the categorization is, is of some help, but it will not be of, uh, it won't give you absolute certainty there what's going to happen. But that's not to be expected when we talk about mechanisms. Let me now just finish by talking a little bit about the second part, I mean, the moral permissibility. There are lots of uh, discussions about how uh, behavioral policy might be morally acceptable or rather why they, are not, why they are not. They tend to be suffering from the same problem as the previous question, namely a sort of global account. So all nudges are bad. That's a, that, that, that's, that sort of has for a long time been the, uh, uh, the discussion. Or the contrary, all nudges, are, they're not, that's absolutely untrue, nudges aren't bad. Uh, instead, what I'm looking for, again, with the tool of categorization is to differentiate here. Uh, to say, okay, so in some, it probably doesn't depend merrily on the intervention. It, it depends on how the intervention uh, operates through, this, through the system, through the individual, through the population. And um, let me just pick out this one case, a particular notion of autonomy. So that's something that people have often discussed with respect, that not just our autonomy uh, violating. Well, Autonomy is extensively discussed philosophy. I'm only using one famil family of accounts, an externalist account that says, uh, in order for me to perform an autonomous action or to be an autonomous agent, I must have the right kind of history um, in acquiring the motivations that drive me to act in a certain way. So I must have acquired those motivations uh, by reflecting on my other values, and I must not sort of just be, uh, for example, hypnotized and then sort of suddenly have that uh, uh, motivation and, act, and then act on it. That will be a, a very heteronymous uh, 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 choice that I make. So therefore, the question is, well, what caused the agents' evaluations and intentions? And are these evaluations and intentions based on reflected judgments? And these are clearly uh, questions that relate to the mechanisms of making decisions. And that we can now take from our mechanistic scheme and say, OK, so is there potentially a difference between boosts and nudges? Uh, so you see, I'm, uh, I'm rushing through this a little bit. but in the boost, as I said before, requires that people are motivated. Motivated both in being trained in acquiring a new heuristic, but also motivated to then apply it. Yeah? Think of the, uh, the harassment uh, case as, as well. it won't work without, you, without my cooperation. I will not suddenly find myself performing these acts described on the cartoon unless I am motivated to help someone, unless I feel that I should do that. Now, you might say, well, the underlying motivation itself was already heteronymous. Maybe someone, I mean, you suggested that in your anal analysis of the poster, there might be ways that this might be a social norm. You actually individually you really don't want to do this, but you feel you're forced to do this. But that's not the problem of the boost. This is the problem of the motivation that you might have had before to the extent that you actually want to help, but so far have felt that that was too dangerous and you, you come, get into a really awkward situation, the boost just provides you with the competence to realize the motivation that you had before and does so in uh, an autonomous preserving way. Now, compare this to a nudge. In the nudge case, you don't necessarily need a strong motivation to acquire that cue and follow uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the cue that comes from that context. To the contrary, you will often end up with a de the, default, the defaulted uh, option without you necessarily wanting it. In fact, there are studies about uh, default setting uh, policies in retirement. This is a sort of a survey study, so one has to 
be a little bit careful maybe, but where people express strong regret that they were actually default, that they followed the default and they ended up with that, what was the default even though they did, afterwards they said they didn't want this. Uh, so there is some indication that a nudge can, in some circumstances, completely circumvent uh, the, any, any motivational questions altogether. It just might make you do that. However, one has to also very clear, so, and therefore it might overrule even existing motivation. However, it's not always the case that there were strong existing motivations, or if they were existing motivations, that these motivations were heteronymous, uh, sorry, autonomous. And this is, I think, a point that Sunstein has already made uh, numerous times, so saying, well, look, we are just a reaction. Huh? We're nudging people because industry has been, uh, has been applying the same techniques for decades in, in order to get them to buy their, their useless products, or products that they, people don't need. Huh? And now we are trying to, sort of, to push against that. In which case, you can, of course, argue that such, such a nudge is not autonomy violating. It just it goes against the motivation. However, that motivation has been the product of uh, previous industry uh, manipulation in such a way that it doesn't deserve a defense from an autonomy perspective to stop. To do that, however, you need to, need to be very clear what motivations are actually affected, which motivations are potentially overruled or circumvented. And it's only through that that you will be able to determine whether in a particular domain, a, doma a nudge might violate autonomy or not. Okay, that was it. Um, here's just a summary, and if you're interested, here are some of the papers. Uh, from which I've drawn. Thank you very much.